Good to be here this morning. It's been a while since I uh, got to visit uh, Springwood, so uh, but, uh, it's good to be here. And uh, when uh, Pastor Matt rang me and asked me if I'd uh, be willing to fill in while he went to Ingham, I said I'd love to. I always enjoy visiting up here. So it's good to be here today. Now, if I'm a bit croaky, please excuse me. I came down and went to our youth camp, preached at our youth camp uh, on the June long weekend and uh, caught a massive head and chest cold, <coughs> which knocked me about for a while. Then I caught COVID on top of that. So, uh, and I just came out of quarantine yesterday. So <coughs> if I sound croaky and that, please uh, excuse my voice today. But uh, we'll see how we go. We're going to turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter 5, if you would please, this morning. Daniel chapter 5. <clears throat> and uh, we're just going to read the first four verses of Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to look at the whole chapter, but we're going to just read the first four verses before we have a word of prayer. Chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before a th the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he was taste tested, sorry, and while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and the silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels, that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Let's pray. <coughs> Gracious Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the book of Daniel. And we pray that, Lord, as we look at some thoughts out of this chapter this morning, that, Lord, uh, our hearts be refreshed and challenged. Uh, Lord, we know your word is true. We know that it's divine revelation uh, given to us by inspiration. And Father, we pray today that you take your inspired word and by your spirit you would apply it to our hearts and lives. You know us individually, Lord. You know our individual needs. I pray today you'd meet those needs through your word. Give me wisdom, I pray, from on high. May I have clarity of thought and may I be used of you this morning. May it be you only that is seen. May it be your word only that's heard. And may the Savior be exalted and praised as we join together in this place. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> I'll probably need it. By the time we come to Daniel chapter 5, we find that Daniel has been in Babylon for several years. Now, if you know the story of Daniel, you know that in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel, at 14 years of age, is taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, as part of the, part of the first of three deportations. All the young men, the princes of Israel, are taken to Babylon to be trained in the Babylonian ways. And we know that Daniel was 14 years of age, along with his friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went into captivity there under Nebuchadnezzar. By the time we come to chapter 5 of Daniel, Daniel has been in Babylon for a number of years. Nebuchadnezzar is now dead. And Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, is upon the throne. And in Daniel chapter 5, God demonstrates how long-suffering and how merciful he is to a sinner in allowing us another opportunity to serve him another opportunity to be saved. Because you know, like Belshazzar, one day time will be over. One day opportunities will be lost forever. One day the opportunity to be saved will be gone. One day the opportunity to serve will be gone. One day it will be over. Time will come to an end eventually. And all of us one day will face the judgment. And unless we today do right, unless today we are saved, unless today we're serving the Lord, unless today we're doing right, one day it will be too late. And in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar is holding a party. And I want you to see when, first of all, this morning the party begins. We've already read the first four verses, so we won't read them again just yet. But when we meet Belshazzar, he's giving one of his famous parties. And I say famous parties because they were famous. You read the history books, 
You read about Belshazzar, you read that he was a man who was known for his partying. And in verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords, drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden silver vessels of his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. This feast, was with all, as with all of his feasts, was a sensual, sinful affair. What we find here is a king who is not concerned about who God is, not concerned with acknowledging there is a God in heaven, not concerned uh, with living for God. We find a king who just lives for self, lives for pleasure, and lives for sin. It's recorded in the history books that Belshazzar spent all night partying and getting drunk and spent all day sleeping it off. And that was his cycle of life. He would drink, get drunk, and sleep it off the next day, have a party, get drink, get drunk, have a party, uh, sleep all the next day. And that was his pattern of life. So much so that in verse 3 we read, Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which were, was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Now this scene of Daniel chapter 5 is a scene of absolute stupidity. Not only because of the partying, not only because he's getting drunk, not only because he's drinking out of the vessels from the temple, but if you know what's happening at the time of this party, you know that this is absolute stupidity. Because history tells us that for three years, Belshazzar's enemies have been planning to overthrow Babylon. In fact, Belshazzar was known for three years that his enemy was advancing on him and now the enemy was at the gate of the city ready to attack that night. For three years, his enemies, the Medo-Persians, have been diverting the watercourse that runs under the city of Babylon into another watercourse. They'd been building a dam, and this night they were going to divert the water away from under the city, and they were going to enter the city under the gates where the water flowed. And they've been planning this for three years. You can't just do that overnight. For three years, they've been planning this. For three years, they've been working on this water course. For three years, they've been heading towards Babylon. And this night, they're at the gates of the city, and Belshazzar is partying. It's a scene of stupidity. He continued to sin with no thought for the future. He's more concerned with enjoying life than living for the Lord. He's more concerned with enjoying life and living in sin than for his safety. And you know, as you read this chapter, I don't know about you, but I can't help but think that that sin is a lot like our world today. You know, our world generally has no time for God. Our world has no concern for the impending danger. Because we know, those of us who say, we know that Jesus is coming again. And we know that when he comes, the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the tribulation. And the tribulation is going to be a time of God pouring out his judgment on the world like never has been seen before. And our world is on, carrying on as though nothing is going to happen. Hap looking towards the future, living uh, in sin, living as though there's nothing to worry about not concerned about the impending danger. Eternity is standing at life's door, yet man is unconcerned. Man is more concerned about fossil fuels and carbon mixed emissions and uh, the planet than they're concerned about their spiritual needs and eternity and what lies beyond. The devil has done such a great job of distracting our world into thinking there's nothing to worry about as far as eternity is concerned. And man lives a life as though there's nothing to worry about. And I wonder this morning, are you concerned about the future? Do you have time for God? Do you know the Savior? 
Do you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior today? Can you say, Pastor Davies, I know with absolute certainty there's a time and place in my life where I recognize myself as a sinner before a holy God and I prayed unto Him and called out to Him for salvation and I know for a fact that I'm saved. Do you know you're saved today? You see, God says in His Word that you're a fool if you don't know that. Because now is the time to be saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, judgment is coming. Eternity is coming. The party will one day be over. Are you ready? Do you know the Savior? And those of us who are saved, those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, are we living with eternity in view? Are we living with eternity's values in view? What, what do we live for? Are we living for self and living for selfish ambition and living for this world, or are we living with eternity in view? You see, life is not supposed to be a continuous party, sensual or otherwise, for the believer. Life for you and I who are saved, life for the believer, ought to be a life that's lived for the glory of God. That's our purpose, God's glory. That's why you and I were saved. We were saved for His glory. You and I are here on this planet for the purpose of being a witness for His glory so that the world that's lost and dying and on the way to hell can see that there is a God in heaven and a Savior who loves them and they can escape the judgment that is to come. That's what we're here for, to live for His glory. The world will have you and I join its party. Not necessarily simply in the party, but have us join the party. Have you and I get so distracted by this world, so distracted by its uh, uh, philosophies, and so distracted by its morals, and so distracted by all that it does, get us so distracted that you and I have no time for God and His glory. But God will have you and I live a life that's honoring unto Him. We know this verse well, but go with me to Colossians chapter 3, please. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. We're to set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth, because we are risen with Christ. And yet, you know, as we look around the world today and look around our country today, many people, including believers, a living like life is one big party with no concern for the future, no concern for eternity, no concern for what is around the corner, living our lives, living their lives as if there is no concerns, no worries, living like Belshazzar was living. But for those of us who are saved, for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior today, we're not to be involved in that party. You and I are not to be involved in the pleasure of sin. You and I are not to be involved in the world and its worldliness. You and I are supposed to live right. We're supposed to do right. We are supposed to live for God and for His glory. Well, let me ask you again, what are you living for? Now, there's no doubt that we live in a sin-orientated world. And what was happening with Belshazzar happens... Most nights of the week in Australia, somewhere, people are having parties, living in sensual, sinful uh, relationships and affairs and so on around the world. It happens everywhere. What's happening in Daniel's day is nothing unique. Mankind knows how to sin well. 
And we live in a sin-orientated community, society. Mankind is living today as if there is no God. But judgment is fast approaching. And therefore, as believers, you and I more than ever today need to live in the knowledge that there is a God and there is judgment coming and that sinners need the Savior. We need to do what Matthew 6.33 says. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things should be added in us. We need to seek first the kingdom of God. Now we're going to see that's exactly what Daniel was doing at this time. That's what Daniel was living. He'd done that since chapter 1 of Daniel when he was 14 years of age and now he's probably in his 70s. He's still living that way on this day. And as believers, that's how we need to live in this dark world in which we live. You and I today need to shine brighter than ever before. As it gets darker by the moment, you and I as believers need to be shining lights. Our lights need not to be hid. They need to be out there on the mountaintop for all to see. So my people might see God's glory, might see Jesus Christ, might turn unto him because time is short. The question for all of us is, what are we living for? We're living for self or for God's glory. The party has begun. But next we see the party interrupted. Look in verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote... Now, we've just read in the first four verses that Belshazzar stopped at nothing to defy God. So much so that he'd taken the temple vessels that his father Nebuchadnezzar had captured from Israel. He took the temple vessels of the Jews and he was using them in his party. He was drinking out of the temple vessels. It says that for us in verse uh, uh, 3. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. Belshazzar stopped at nothing in defying God. And now he's about to face his God. For that very night, Belshazzar would stand face to face with God in eternity. And here in verse 5, we note how God interrupts this party at Belshazzar. Because that night God comes in a very powerful, dramatic way to get Belshazzar's attention. It says, in the same hour, while the party's going on, came forth the fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. I don't know about you, but if I saw a hand appear against the wall and started to write, I mean, behind me right now, you saw the hand of God writing on the wall, it would get your attention, wouldn't it? Without a doubt, you would be arrested in your attention right now. Uh, You would stop listening to me and you would have these looks on your faces, which make me aware that I'd either said something absolutely dumb, which I do from time to time, or something else is going on. And that's exactly what's happening here. There upon the plaster, where the honors have been inscribed of the Babylonian warriors and the national heroes, God writes his message of judgment to Belshazzar. And we're going to see that in short, the, the message of judgment is this, it is time to meet your God, Belshazzar. Are you ready? And each of us one day will face God and the reality is you and I cannot escape the judgment no more than Belshazzar could escape it Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment and just like Belshazzar for everybody in this place today and everybody in our world today the day is coming whereby God will interrupt this world's party and judgment will come. Because at the point on the man wants to die, the inevitability of death is a reality. 
No one can escape it. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And let me ask you again, are you ready? Are you ready to meet your God? Let me ask you again, do you know that you're saved today? Do you know the Savior? I know I sound like I'm repeating myself, but the, the reason I'm repeating myself is because the events of Daniel chapter 5 are a stark reminder to us that judgment is coming. There's a point on a man wants to die, and after the judgment, and it can't be escaped. One day we will all face our God. The question is, are you ready? Do you know the Savior today? You see, Christ died for each and every one of us. He died so that our sins might be forgiven. He died so that we might have salvation, so that you and I might have our sins forgiven, that you and I might have a home in heaven, that you and I might look forward with joy to meeting our God. You see, Daniel in this story is going to come and intervene in the events of this night, and Daniel is a man who is not afraid to meet his God. Because Daniel knew God. Daniel had lived for God. Daniel had served God. Daniel had was saved. And the question for us is, do you know the Savior? You know, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ died for you and for me because God loved us. So let me ask you again, are you ready to meet your God? And if not, if you don't know the Savior, why not today before it's too late? You see, Belshazzar was living a life of party and fun with no concern or thought of the future, no concern or thought of God, no concern or thought of eternity. But that very night, he met his God. And today may be the day that you meet your God. Are you ready? Once again, if we're saved, are we ready to meet the Lord? Are we living for God? It's as certain as it is for an unsaved man like Belshazzar to face his God one day, it's as certain for you and I. It's appointed unto man, all men and all women. It's appointed unto us, appointed to die. And after that, the judgment, all of us, even those who are saved, will one day face our God. Are we ready? Will we hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? We all will stand before the judgment seat one day. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Apostle Paul talking to believers makes this statement. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body whether they, uh, according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. You and I one day are all going to stand before the beamer seat if we're saved. And we're going to be judged according to our works. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's going to set fire to our works, and that which is wood, hay, and stubble will burn up, and that which is gold and silver and precious stone will remain. And only that which remains is that which we've done for the Lord. Are we ready to meet our God? Now you can imagine Belshazzar here, can't you? And his response in the middle of the party as he sees the handwriting on the wall. 
Now, I don't know how drunk he is at this time, but I guarantee you he sobered up very quickly as he sees this handwriting on the wall. In fact, the Bible tells us that his strength left him, his knees began to knock, and fear filled his heart. Look at verse 6. Then the king's countenance was changed, his thoughts troubled him, so that his joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. He's a little nervous right now. His knees are knocking, his stomach is churning. He's feeling rather unwell. One commentator said, pale, confused and trembling at the knees, the king arose and called for help from his Chaldean magicians, which is what he does in verse 7. The king cried aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoso shall read this writing, and show me the interpretation thereof, shall be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but none could read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was the king Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astoned. You know, the king offers to all of his wise men in the kingdom, he offers them a high position. If they'd only tell him what the words mean and give the interpretation of those words, read the writing, give the interpretation thereof, he would give them great riches. Now, the amazing thing here is that, you know, most times in those kingdoms, the magicians would have made up a story just to get the reward. But in this instance, as they look at the writing of the wall, they can't even read the writing, let alone interpret the writing. They had never seen anything like this. They never encountered anything like this in their lives. They had no means of interpreting for Belshazzar what was going on. Therefore, he is greatly troubled because he knows this is significant. But he doesn't know the significance of it. They're astonished because their king is so upset, their king is so concerned, their king is so feeling so sick at this time, and they cannot help him one bit. Because the world has no answers. The world could not tell Belshazzar what he needed to hear. The world had no answer for him. Just like today, the world has no answer for our needs. The world has no answer for the world's problems. The world thinks it has the answers, but Jesus Christ is the only answer. Whatever other crises are going on in this world, the thing that people need the most is Jesus Christ. With all of the other crises and all the you know, the fuel prices and all the food crisis and every other crisis going on around the world, Jesus Christ is the answer. And the world doesn't need another scientist. The, other, the world doesn't need another uh, spiritual leader who has no idea about who God is. The world doesn't need another political leader. What the world needs today is Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace. What the world needs today is his children, those of us who know the Savior, to let them know who Jesus is. And that's what Belshazzar needed. All of his earthly leaders and helpers and astrologers couldn't help him one bit. They were completely baffled. They could neither read nor interpret the writing. Now, it's interesting, when the wise men were called, to explain the writing on the wall to Belshazzar, Daniel wasn't called. Now, I don't know the real reason why he wasn't called. It seems that by this time, maybe Daniel is semi-retired. As I said, he's around 70 years of age at this time. He still holds government office, yet it seems like he's out of the loop. That his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had listened to him and had used him as his advisor, but Belshazzar had rejected Daniel for some reason. And so when all these wise men, all these 
the chancellor, chancellors come, when all these Chaldeans come, when all these soothsayers come, Daniel is not amongst them. But the Queen Mother, according to Daniel chapter 5, verse 10 through 12, remembers Daniel. Notice what it says in verse 10. Now the Queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the Queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Now in the days of thy father, the light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and turning of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called. And you'll show the interpretation. Huh. Oh, what a great testimony, hey? <laughs> now this is the not the mother of Belshazzar's father. If this is his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar's grandfather, we know that Nabonidus is his father. So this is the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, this is his grandmother, not his direct mother. All right, even though she's called the mother here. And uh, she comes and testifies just all about Daniel. She's not forgotten him. Belshazzar might have forgotten all the other magicians and astrologers may have forgotten him, but Dan but uh, the mother of the queen, uh, mother of the king, had not forgotten. The queen had remembered him. So Daniel is called before the king in verse thirteen. Then was Daniel brought before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel? which are of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry. I have heard, I, I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men and the astrologers have been brought in before me, they, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And as I said, these verses give a wonderful testimony of Daniel's life. <coughs> Daniel was known as a man of God. In fact, he repeats that. Uh, uh, Belshazzar repeats what, is, uh, what the queen has said in verse 14. He says, I have heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. What a great testimony. You know, from the very beginning of his journey in Babylon, Daniel had always sought to do right. At the age of 14, back in chapter 1, for those of you who remember, let's go back there, those of you who don't remember, let's go back there. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the porch of the king's meat, nor with the wine that he, which he drank, Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel at 14 years of age stands up. He purposes in his heart. And throughout his life, that purpose, that conviction had led him. He never wavered. When you get to Daniel chapter 6, which we're going to look at tonight, at the end of his life, at 84 years of age, he still has that purpose of heart. He still has that conviction. For 70 years, Daniel has a purpose of heart, a conviction for his God, and everybody knows it, except for Belshazzar. Everybody knows it. They know about Daniel and his testimony. So when they needed answers, when the king is confronted with the reality of eternity, when he realizes that that night something significant has happened, when he realizes that the world cannot help him, when he realizes his spiritual leaders cannot help him, when he realizes that the soothsayers cannot help him, he turns to the only man in the kingdom who can, the man who loves the God of heaven. It's the testimony of Daniel that leads to this opportunity for Daniel to intercede. Reveal just how great God is. At the time of greatest need, they turned to Daniel.
Some one commentator said this: When everything seems great, seems great, when the party is going non-stop, God and His servants are mocked, neglected, and hidden away. But when the hand of heaven's writes on the walls of one's life a sobering message, panic-stricken worldlings cry out for the one who has the Spirit of God. You know, Daniel had a testimony, a great testimony. And like Daniel, you and I need to have a testimony, such a testimony that this world, as it tumbles into chaos, can look upon the stormy sea and see something that makes sense, that Jesus Christ is the answer, and that you and I as believers are the means by which they can find the Savior. See, the world is looking for answers. They're looking in the wrong place, but they're looking for answers. That's why you and I as believers need to have a testimony that is such, that stands out, that all those around us know that we love the Savior, know that we are confident in the Lord, that you and I are the ones who have the answers, that in the midst of a world that is in chaos, you and I still have a smile on our face, still have a spring on our step, that you and I are rejoicing in the Lord. And when they say, what's up with you? Things are pretty bad. Say, yes, but Jesus is coming again. You see, the darker it gets, folks, the earlier the dawn is. And for believers, we shouldn't be walking around with long faces and all worried about what's going on in the world. Sure, it's a terrible place we live in, but Jesus is coming again. You see, we need a testimony like Daniel that the spirit of the living God dwells within us, that we shine bright in the darkness, that when the world has wants answers, they look and they can see in the distance a shining light. It's a born-again believer who has the answer for eternity. Jesus is the answer. But you know, sometimes we're so dark they can't see the light. We're just as worried as they are. We're just as frantic as they are. We're just as concerned as they are. But beloved, when we love the Lord, when we trust him, we have nothing to fear. Is it true that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory? Is that true? Then what are we worried about? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Isn't that what it says? And all these things, all what things, your material needs shall be added unto you. I seem to think there's a lot of verses like that in the Word of God, isn't there? See, in the midst of troubled times, in the midst of times whereby there's handwriting on the walls and the unbelievers have no idea what's going on, they're trembling, they're sick to the stomach, the believer has the answer. Are we a bright light in a dark place? Daniel was. We need to live our lives in such a way that people can look to us for the answer. And then that you and I have the answer. As it says in 1 Peter 3.15, we need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us. The reason of the hope is in us with meekness and fear. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 16, we read this. And I heard of thee that thou canst make interpretation and dissolve doubts. If thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scars and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and thou shalt be third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel has offered a great reward. If you'll just tell me what the answer is, I will make you third ruler in the kingdom. I'll give you a chain of gold. I'll give you whatever you want. Just tell me what it is. Daniel refuses. The gifts. Look what he says in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. Give thy royal reward to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make it known to him the interpretation, O thou king, the most high God gave. Daniel refuses the rewards because Daniel didn't seek the reward of men. His whole life, in Babylon, has been driven by a desire to give glory to God. And that's what he does yet again. 
All Daniel's ever wanted is God to get the glory. You read it in Daniel chapter 1, read in Daniel chapter 3, uh, chapter 2, sorry, chapter 4, and now in chapter 5 and in chapter 6, you read uh, the story of Daniel and you find the one underlying theme of Daniel's life is that Daniel always wanted God to get the glory. And even now, he simply wants God to get the glory. Daniel, had he turned his values in view, he sought to glorify the Lord. And if you and I are saved today, according to Ephesians chapter 1, then you and I were saved for the glory of God. You and I were saved for his glory. And therefore we ought to live for his glory. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, please. First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse... 19, what, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We are to glorify God. The party having been interrupted by the hand of God, now it comes to an end. And so thirdly this morning, let's look at the party's over. The party's over. Verse 18, we read, O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. What we find here is the last sermon that Belshazzar ever heard on earth. And what a sermon it is, by the way. Daniel holds nothing back. And Daniel told him what happened firstly to his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. And now because he was stiff-necked and hard-hearted, he then tells him what's going to happen to him. Look in verse 19. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations and languages, trembled and feared before him, whom he, would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts. And his dwelling was of the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. He tells him what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. Nebuchadnezzar, that head of gold that was talked about in Daniel chapter 2, this great king, Nebuchadnezzar, who had been given by God such a lofty place, such a, a great responsibility of the kingdom of Babylon, but who had no thought for God. And God had to bring him down low and he brought him to the place whereby he was like the animals of the field and he ate the grass and the dew of the earth sat upon him. <coughs> Excuse me. And God's word tells us he then turns to God of heaven. And when he does, God delivers him. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, when God got his attention, Nebuchadnezzar listened to God. But in the case of Belshazzar, Belshazzar has no time for God. And so we read in verse 22, And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, they brought the vessels of the house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, of iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. 
You see, Belshazzar is in a different position than Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar was confronted with who God was, Nebuchadnezzar turned to God and received God as the God of heaven. Belshazzar knew that. This was his granddad. You can't tell me that this grandson had never heard the stories of his grandfather ending up like an animal in the field eating grass. Uh, no. This is, this is a legendary story. This is a story that would have been told by the princes and by all the other people in the palace and by Nebuchadnezzar himself and by the queen mother as well. These may well have been bedtime stories he told about the God of heaven. Belshazzar knew about God. He knew who God was. He knew how great God was. He knew what God had done for Nebuchadnezzar and he knew how Nebuchadnezzar glorified the God of heaven and yet he rejected God. And because he has, he's now about to face the consequence. Daniel preached the truth. And now he was about to face his God. Belshazzar rejected the truth. And now he's about to face the judgment. And today more than ever, our world and our friends need to hear the truth. You see, one day the party will be over. One day it will be too late for our unsaved friends, our unsaved family to hear the gospel and be saved. They need to hear it today. Because one day, like Belshazzar, the party's going to end. They're going to come face to face with the judgment. And what they've done with Jesus Christ is the only thing that will matter. Daniel now interprets the writing on the wall. It says in verse 24, Then was the part of the hand set from him. And this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tackle you fasten. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tackle thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Thy kingdom is numbered. Weighed and divided. Thy kingdom is finished. Belshazzar fell short of God's requirements. And Babylon is going to be divided amongst the Medes and the Persians. The enemy is, even now, is silently passing through the streets of the city on the way to the royal hall. As Daniel is making this declaration, Darius the Mede is leading his troops silently through the city for a bloodless coup that night. God was about to put an end to the party. Belshazzar fell short of God's standard. Belshazzar, like so many today, had let God out of, left God out of his life. And like Belshazzar, all of us have fallen short of God's glory, for the Bible tells us all of sin and come short of the glory of God. All of our righteousness is filthy rags according to Isaiah 64, 6. And the wage of sin is death, according to Romans 6, 23. But the good news is that salvation awaits all who will receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Because while we have breath, while we have time, you can still be saved. You see, until you breathe the last breath, God still will save you. And will save our families and friends if they just turn to the Savior. You and I have all been weighed in the balances. You and I have all been found wanting, and one day we'll stand before God. And so let me ask you again, are you ready to meet your God? If you don't know the Savior, one day it will be too late. Why not trust Him today? Are you ready to face eternity? Are you saved? The greatest choice you can make is a choice of the gift of eternal life. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That gift of salvation is offered to you today. And if you're here today and don't know the Savior, the offer is yours. While ever there is breath, there is opportunity. But remember this, today you may meet your God. 
today may be the last opportunity. Today may be the day that judgment falls. Do you know the Savior? And if you're saved, let me ask you again, are you living for God? Are you living for God's glory? Or will we be found wanting when Jesus comes? Will we hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? What are we living for? Are we living for self? Are we living for God's glory? Here's the contrast. Belshazzar, a man living for self. No concern for God. No concern for eternity. No concern for the future. Partying his life away. Daniel, a man who purposed in his heart at 14 years of age to live for his God, to serve his God, to do whatever God required of him. And here are these two men standing face to face. One is sure of eternity. He knows the Savior. The other is going to spend eternity separated from God in the lake of fire because he failed to choose God. Daniel chose to serve the Lord. And what a rousing entry he would have received into glory. When Daniel had finished his pronouncement, the only thing the king could do was reward Daniel. Look in verse 29. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night, it says, was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. It was too late for Belshazzar. The party was over. He missed God's now of salvation. That night Darius the Mede and his army swarmed in the city on the dry riverbed that ran through the city, that riverbed that they'd been damming up for three years. That night Darius and his army marched in under the gates on the muddy riverbed into the city. He led a bloodless coup. The city of Babylon woke up the next morning to a new king. The only one who died, by the way, was Belshazzar that night. They woke up to Darius, the king. They climbed under the walls of the city, into the palace. Now the city of luxury and fame woke the next morning to a new king, a new nation in control, and their beautiful city in shambles. God's word had been fulfilled. Belshazzar met his God that night. There's no other chapter of the Bible, Daniel 5, we have brought face to face with the awful reality that it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. We all need to make sure that we're ready to meet our God. Let me ask you again, are you ready? Are you ready? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the book of Daniel. We thank you, Father God, for the challenge of Daniel chapter 5. Lord God, the reality that eternity is standing at the door. And what we do with Christ now determines where we'll spend eternity. And what we do with Christ now determines our rewards in eternity. Lord, challenge us today to be ready to meet. Our God. Bless now we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.